take our Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Acts. Notes are there for you on you version as well. You can press your way to that. You won't be able to flip, but you can press your way to you version. But Acts chapter 1, can we read together from verse 4 through verse 8? Gathering them together, Jesus commanded not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they began asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? But he said to them, it is not for you to know periods of time or appointed times which the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and as far as the remotest parts of the earth. Lord, open our hearts this morning, Lord, to your life-giving word. Holy Spirit, move in our midst, drawing us to the will and to the heart of our Father through faith in Christ. Lord, may your kingdom come in this place, in every heart, in every individual, and may your will be done here within us, among us, and through us as it is in heaven fully and completely. We ask it and pray it in Jesus' mighty name and everyone together said, Amen and Amen. You know, today... I know Friday, Carol graduated, and then we've got graduations coming up, baccalaureate for GW Long here at the church that we're going to be celebrating with the graduates from GW Long, and then I know the others will be graduating this coming week, or actually this is the first day of the week, so it would be this week. But I don't know if it escaped your attention or not, but today is Pentecost Sunday. And the way we know it's Pentecost Sunday is because it was the day of, of the harvest celebration. And it was a festival that was kept by Israel. And you begin counting from the Passover, and from the end of the Passover, 50 days is the feast of harvest, or what we call Pentecost. There are many Christians that do not understand the role of Holy Spirit in their lives as believers. And I'm not being presumptuous in that statement, but in talking and listening to believers, there's many that misunderstand or they don't understand the role of Holy Spirit in our lives as believers. We just sang the song of the blessing that God spoke to Aaron. As high priest in in number six to speak over Israel. Praying a prayer of blessing upon God's people. That they understood that God was present with them. And that he was a good father. As we celebrate Pentecost, and it's not just one time a year, but daily, we are celebrating the goodness of our heavenly father. There are some that misunderstand, and like some believers in Paul's day, they, individuals that maybe misunderstand the role or, or don't fully understand the role of Holy Spirit in their lives as a child of God, they, they realize that Holy Spirit led them to faith in Jesus. Unless the Spirit draw us, we cannot come to Him. Unless the Spirit convicts us, we're not even aware of our sinfulness and we're in need of a Savior. But if You know, we think that he just draws us and just convicts us of sin, and then we kind of have to figure out things on our own. 
Kind of like if individuals I heard, my parents never did this to me. We want to learn to swim, we'll go to the river and we'll chunk you in and then you got to make it back to shore. God doesn't do that to us. Now, granted, the parents were right there to jump in if they didn't do it. But he doesn't leave us to ourselves to figure things out once we come to faith in Christ through the drawing of the Holy Spirit. And notice we've just read this morning from Acts 1.8, but you will receive. Who is he speaking to? He is speaking to children of God. He is speaking to God's people, to Christians as a whole. You will receive, as disciples of Christ, power when Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is the promise that Christ gave. Because did he not say that you've heard of this blessing and this promise that I spoke to you about? The promise given by Christ in this verse that we've just read is that his witnesses will be given achieving power when Holy Spirit comes upon them. Now, the basic meaning of power here can be summed up in one word, ability. Ability. The Lord will bring to the lives of his disciples spiritual competence, achieving power for our walk in him and for him, as well as our ministry and calling as his witnesses to the indwelling presence of Holy Spirit. Therefore, Jesus is telling us as his disciples that the indwelling presence of Holy Spirit in our lives as believers is a transformative reality. It transforms us. Transformative, that word just means it, there is a marked change that is brought about in something. For us, it would be our lives. That we see the reality of this transformative power, this transformative reality when Holy Spirit came upon the lives of his disciples that he was speaking to here in the first chapter of Acts. The very individuals who became the vessels of the Spirit's presence, vessels of His purpose and power on the day of Pentecost, were the same ones who had run away a few weeks before when Jesus was arrested. It's the same individuals. And there is nothing when we read the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that could make us guess that, as I've heard others say, this ragtag bunch of individuals would react with any different equal measure of doubt and arrogance as they had before and would become people that God would use to change the world. When we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, And John, we can identify with the disciples, can't we? Trouble came to Jesus, they ran. They forsook him. Jesus was forsook by Peter verbally. And as we read this, we say, these are the individuals that God is going to use to transform the world? But when you and I wonder, as children of God, if we've got the right stuff, I know it's an older movie back in the 80s. Y'all remember the story about the, the beginning of the space program and it was called The Right Stuff? Any of you ever watched that movie? They had to have the right stuff to do the things that they did. In fact, they gave their lives, some gave their lives to have the right stuff, to be included in this program to reach the moon. But even for us as children of God that we may wonder, do I have what it takes? Do I have the right stuff? Or if God could possibly use me to touch someone else's life, all we have to do is to remember the people of Pentecost. At the moment we trust Christ as our Lord and Savior, Holy Spirit enters our lives and transforms our citizenship from the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of God. Can we say amen to that reality? And he bears witness with our spirit that we belong to God. We don't have to wonder. 
Because He is there constantly with us daily, whispering assurance to our hearts. As Paul says in Romans 8, 16, a whole chapter that talks about the Spirit working in our lives. But Romans 8, 16, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. Holy Spirit works each day. From that moment when we confess faith, I'm talking not just praying a prayer. Because just praying a prayer doesn't make us right with God. We can repeat the word someone else says, but if it isn't coming from our heart and we aren't yielding ourselves to the Lord, it means absolutely nothing. It is worthless. But if inside, deep inside, and I have been with individuals, they couldn't even get the words out. But they didn't have to get the words out because their own spirit, their heart was talking to God. And at that moment, God forgave them and cleansed them. And the Spirit of God came into their lives as He comes into all of our lives when we confess faith. And He begins to work in us. To work through the Word of God. To work in relationships that we have with other believers who love us. To work in the good times and in the bad. And to gradually transform us and conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. Because that is the will of God. That we would be like Jesus. It is a lifelong journey. It is a lifelong process that we call sanctification. This was the reason for the urgency from Jesus to the disciples, for them to wait. And Jesus tells his disciples to wait in Jerusalem because he will bring the transformative power from heaven to them. And we find the 120 in Acts 2 in the position of obedient, expectant waiting. To live and grow in the promises of God in Christ, obedient, expectant, waiting, must be our daily position. And just as a side note, Jesus told them to wait to be endued with power, right? Maybe the reason I'm not endued with power for the day is because I'm not waiting. My position is to wait in obedient, expectant faith that God would give me what I need for each day to live for Him and to testify of the truth of who He is. And so the disciples did, as you know the story, Acts 2, 1 through 4. They were waiting. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a noise like a violent rushing wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And tongues that looked like fire appeared to them, distributing themselves and a tongue rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with different tongues as the Spirit was giving them the ability To speak out. So the promise that Jesus spoke of became a reality on this day, on the day of Pentecost, for these, but also for us that give our hearts fully to the Lord. The reality of the presence of Holy Spirit in the lives of the 120 that day was not a fleeting emotional experience. Please hear what I'm saying. It's not a fleeting emotional experience. It was and is a transformative reality of the presence of Holy Spirit in their lives and in our lives that causes a marked change within us. It was the promise that Jesus had spoken of. It was the sign that the Messiah had come. And it paid the penalty for our sin. In fact, John the Baptist stated this in Matthew 3 and verse 11. He says, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. 
that he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He, Jesus, will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. If there is a word that is a good synonym for the word baptize, it's the word overwhelm. And the reason I believe the word overwhelm is a good synonym for baptize because the word baptize as is tr- translated for us in the Greek, it always means to immerse. Immerse. So if we are baptized in water, it's why we do when we have baptismal service. We immerse individuals under the water and they come back up, signifying outwardly what has taken place inwardly. They are a new creation. They have died to self, and have been resurrected to new life in Christ. If we are baptized in Holy Spirit, our lives are to be immersed in the presence of Holy Spirit. And if our lives are immersed in the presence of Holy Spirit, then our lives would be immersed in Jesus. People should see the process of the transformative reality because they see Jesus in us. Because Christ said, the Spirit has not come to testify of himself, he's come to testify of me. Acts 2 doesn't describe for us an emotional high, like a a narcotic. A narcotic can only offer a deceptive high, and when it's over, it causes the person to crash hard back to reality. That doesn't mean... That's not what it means to be filled with the Spirit. It's not what it means to be baptized in the Spirit. That doesn't, it's not what it means to be full of the Holy Spirit and walking in Holy Spirit. Because what Jesus promised in Acts 1.8 and gives in Acts 2 and beyond is a transformative experience to the person of Holy Spirit that spans our lifetime. Our lifetime, not just a moment, our lifetime. Jesus' promise is not meant to be regulated to a one-time event. Holy Spirit is not an event. He's not an event that we simply seek to experience. That's not what it means to be baptized in the person of Holy Spirit through Christ. Holy Spirit is the third person of the triune Godhead that comes into the lives of believers to grow us and deepen our relationship with the Lord. A growing and deepening relationship with Christ is only possible through the indwelling presence of Holy Spirit within us. Jesus promises a reality that we personally personally experience in relationship with him that affects every single part of our being. Every part. Holy Spirit enables us to be more than we are on our own for the glory of God. He enables us to go beyond the possible. To go beyond the possible and to accomplish the Lord's kingdom will. Ephesians 3, verse 20, Paul writes, Now to him, talking about Christ, who was able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. That's beyond the possible, right? According to what? The power, Holy Spirit, that works within us. That our lives, we're able to go beyond what is possible in our minds. What we could think, what we could ask for. We can go beyond to achieve what God desires and what God wants to do. The same spirit that rested on the murderer Moses, turning him into a deliverer. On a shepherd boy, turning him into a king. On fishermen, turning them into world changers for the kingdom of God, rest upon those today who name the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior. God has brought his power to us to enable us to do what he has called us to do and be who he's redeemed us to be in Christ. 
Holy Spirit empowers every believer who accepts Christ's saving grace and humbly makes themselves available to be servants of God. Spirit-empowered discipleship is an amazing divine reality for believers. It's an amazing divine reality for believers. An experienced Spirit-empowered discipleship means Understanding that our relationship goes beyond a simple belief or just the washing away of sins. Belief or faith in Christ's sacrificial death on the cross and in his resurrection from the grave makes a relationship with God possible. Without it, we couldn't have it. The actions of confession and and repentance as we read in the word of our sinfulness along with the full surrender of our lives to Christ as Lord and Savior are certainly the only means of salvation. In fact, Paul put it this way in Romans 10 verses 8 through 10. But what does it say? The word is near you. In your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. But again, God's word is clear that experiencing spirit-empowered discipleship means understanding that our relationship goes beyond just a simple belief or just simply the washing away of our sins. I am not denying that reality, neither am I lessening the miracle of that reality. It is vital. It is of utmost importance. But just when we confess faith in Christ and He becomes our Lord and Savior, it doesn't end. God's work does not end. Spirit-empowered discipleship takes us so much deeper than just a superficial relationship with Christ. It's much more than simply making heaven our home. And I want heaven as my home because I've heard about hell and I don't want to go there. Just as glorious as heaven is, hell in its torment is worse than anything we could ever experience in this life. But a relationship, a spirit empowered relationship. Being a spirit-empowered disciple is so much more than just having a superficial relationship with Christ. They, okay, I've made heaven my home. I'm good now until he calls me home. Making heaven our home, don't misunderstand me, is the reason Jesus came to earth, right? John 3, 16, 17. God so loved the world that he gave his son But once we give our lives to Christ as Lord and Savior, God's not done. He's not done. There is still work to be done. There is still work to be done in us so God can work through us. Acts 2, 1 says, when the day of Pentecost had come. And hang with me here. Hang with me. I feel like if I say that, you guys really pay attention. In fact, somebody told me, Pastor, you haven't said that in a long time. So there you go. Stay with me. When the day of Pentecost had come, that's what Acts 2 1 says. Again, Pentecost, or as it is called in the Old Testament, the Feast of Weeks, seven weeks and a day, was one of the three major feasts of the Jewish calendar year. One of the three major feasts that God said you are to come together and observe. What are they observing? In the Feast of Weeks, they are observing God's faithfulness. They are observing God's covenant that I am the God who is, but I am the God who is active and present among my people. And they are celebrating that provision. Pentecost was a celebration of the Feast of Weeks, it was a celebration of harvest. When the children of Israel would present to the Lord as an offering their first harvest of grain. We find this in Leviticus 23, 17. But in a similar way, we would not be taking the scripture out of context to say that Pentecost 
for us today on this side of Calvary symbolizes for the church the beginning of God's spiritual harvest of souls in the world. I want you to go, Jesus said. And I want you to wait until I bring the transformative power to you. And when I bring the power in the person of Holy Spirit that is not an event, but it is a person, I am with you. I am going to send you out to do what seems impossible. In fact, you're going to go beyond what seems possible. Pentecost symbolizes God's spiritual harvest of souls, the beginning of it. The beginning. We know the promise that we've read in Acts 1 and verse 8. I'm hurrying. And the reality of Acts 2 speaks to our empowerment by Christ for the purpose of speaking the message of the kingdom of God. The focus here is on the mission of the believer, one that cannot be accomplished without the supernatural presence of Holy Spirit within us. It's not just something that we are, to, are tasked to do. It's something we've been born. Have you heard individuals or have you made that statement about someone that when you look at their lives and you look at what they're able to do and just their gifting and their talent, you say that individual was born to do that. There's not an individual that names the name of Jesus that wasn't born to be a soul winner. Not one. Every person in here this morning, those that are listening through the recording If you are a child of God, you have placed your faith in Christ and you place your faith in Him, obedient faith, every day. You were born. We were born to be a soul winner. We were born to bear witness. It's who we are. We were born into it. Paul says, 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in Holy Spirit and with full conviction. We're not speaking opinion. We're speaking conviction. In fact, I heard one minister say we've got too many individuals behind the pulpit that are speaking opinion instead of speaking the conviction of God's word. We speak by the power of Holy Spirit in full conviction Just as you know, now notice what Paul says there to the Thessalonian believers. Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. If we are immersed in Holy Spirit, then we are to act like it. If we are immersed with the prayer, then we are to act like it. And who should we act like? Christ. Because the Spirit hasn't come to testify of himself. He's come to testify the Savior. And here Paul states that it's not just what we say. But Paul says that it's also how we say it. 1 Thessalonians 1.5 But it doesn't stop there because it also deals with who we are. What we say. How we say it. Who we are. All three of these work together through the presence of Holy Spirit in our lives that enables effective witness. Effective witness. Where's the power? Where's the witness? God has sent both, and it's up to us to receive and walk in it. As the musicians come back, when we speak of Pentecost, we are not seeking or praying for an event. Now, I am Pentecostal through and through, and I've made this joke. You guys know this joke. I'm fourth generation. In in other words, in my family, you can go back and you can mark it. I'm fourth generation AG, so I've been in this all my life. I don't question the validity of Holy Spirit. I don't question the validity of the unknown tongue. I don't question the private prayer language or what we experience here also, the public prayer language with an interpretation. I don't deny it. It is real. But understand this, when we seek Pentecost, we're not seeking or praying for an event. We are seeking and praying for the transformative reality of Holy Spirit in our lives that move us beyond the possible for the kingdom of God. That's what we're praying. 
That's what we're seeking. We are seeking the person of Holy Spirit to so immerse our lives in Christ. And yes, it bubbles forth in the unknown tongue. Absolutely. And I thank God for it. But sometimes we get so focused on the tongue, we forget about the heart and the life. The tongue must match the heart and life. In fact, the heart and life gives credence to the tongue. We are seeking, not an event, to recreate something that happened in the past, but we are seeking the transformative reality of Holy Spirit in our lives that moves us beyond the possible for the kingdom of God. Spirit baptism is all about empowerment to take the gospel to an unsaved world. Dr. George Woods, a former general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, stated, you hear a lot about spirit baptism. These are his words. Or I should say were his words. He has gone on to be with the Lord. You hear a lot about spirit baptism, but you don't see much spirit empowerment. There's a disconnect. And unfortunately, he says, in some of our churches, there is never even talk of spirit baptism. Being immersed in the Spirit. He says that ought to alarm us. Baptism is the special treasure, he says, of understanding and experiencing God. The experience God has given us in order to take the gospel into the world. He goes on to say that if the younger generation does not see in the older generation a connection between spirit baptism, spirit empowerment, and spirit fruitfulness... The new generation is going to turn from the whole thing. We must practice a full or view of spirituality and the work of Holy Spirit in our lives. If we only focus on initial experience, the initial physical evidence, and we hold to as the assemblies of God of the evidence of the baptism, if we only focus on the initial experience, we don't have substantial evidence. And it's going to backfire. It's not a question of either or. It's got to be both and. The initial evidence is clear in the opening verses of Acts 2 that we've read. But the substantial evidence is in Acts 2 verses 42 through 47. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all the believers were together and had all things in common. And they would sell their property and possessions and share them with all to the extent that anyone had need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. The substantial evidence by, was by the way they lived. In this passage that we've just read, it presents the mark of a vibrant, spirit-filled church just as we close the message there were few street lamps that, that existed in the 18th century in London, England so a law was passed requiring people to hang out a lantern or a lantern from 6pm to 11pm and at dusk an official with a lantern would walk through the streets of the city crying, it's time to hang out your lights. Millions of people in our world, they need Jesus. They need Jesus. And Holy Spirit is calling to us. He's calling to us. If we believe God can speak to us through an unknown tongue, then why do we not believe God can use the known tongue to speak to the world? The Holy Spirit is calling us. It's time to hang out your lights. Let's allow people to see the mystery which has been hidden from past times and generation. As Paul states in Colossians 1.27, the mystery is Christ in us. 
the hope of glory. Father, Lord, as we just yield our hearts and our lives to you this morning, and we just pray that, God, that your will would be done, that, Lord, that you would stir us, and that, God, that you would move us, oh, God, toward your creative will. Lord, we pray that. Lord, we ask that. Oh, God, move us. Stir us. Come on, can we pray that? Come on, can we pray that just right where we are? Come on. Come on, just pray it. Come on to the Lord. Lord, stir me and move me. Yes, it is a daily prayer that we need to pray. But let's not just pray it for ourselves. Let's pray it for our fellowship. Lord, stir me, move me. But Lord, use me, God, that you're able to flow through me, that we would be stirred collectively as your people, that we would hear the cry of Holy Spirit by the way we live our lives, by the way we talk, how we say things, and how we live, that, Lord, we would hang out the light of our witness of who Christ is. Oh, God, stir us. Stir us. Stir us. Move us. Move us. This morning, as we just take time to open up our hearts to the reality of God's Word, Acts is full of the reality of the transformative experience that Holy Spirit brings. Full of the evidence of that. That God says, I'm going to bring the power, my power, that moves you beyond what is possible in the natural. Are we yielding ourselves? Are we waiting? Are we waiting? Are we waiting upon the Lord that we may be filled with that transformative reality of the presence of Holy Spirit?